This is inverse Z-transform example number one. Plot the pole zero diagram and find the impulse response forms of a system function. All right, let's walk through a general approach for this problem. We are given a system function h of z. And to begin, we want to find the pole zero diagram of this function. For the purposes of finding a pole zero diagram, we need to factor the numerator and denominator polynomials. It will also be easier for plotting the pole zero diagram if we are working in terms of z rather than z inverse. Therefore, for this problem, we can multiply top and bottom each by z squared. We then need to factor the denominator. We would have two factors that we're looking for. And then we can identify the zeros from the numerator and the poles from the denominator. Next, we want to find the impulse response h of n, and we're looking for two different types, either stable or causal, or po perhaps both. But our impulse response is going to be the inverse C transform of our system function h of z. We'll need to apply the partial fraction expansion to do that. Now the dif difference between these two is for stable, we need the region of convergence to contain the unit circle. For causal, we need the region of convergence to be right-sided. All right, let's continue with a detailed solution. To begin with, I want to write the two polynomials in terms of z rather than z inverse. I will multiply top and bottom each by z squared. First apply that to the denominator and then multiply through on the numerator. I'm going to write that as directly as z squared plus 0.25z, and then I've factored out uh, a z out front. We see that we have a zero at the origin and a zero at z equals minus 0.25. We need to factor this quadratic polynomial before we can identify the poles. So I've written the familiar quadratic equation for the roots. Here I'm identifying my coefficients, a, b, and c. This is 0.64, and punching this out on the calculator gives me 3.36. We have 4, that gives us 2. Let's go ahead and divide through by 2. And this gives us the two roots minus 1.4 and positive 0.6. We would then write the denominator as 0 plus 1.4 times 0 minus, or z rather, minus 0 0.6. Now we can identify our poles. We have a pole at z equals minus 1.4 and another one at positive 0.6. Let me sketch the real and imaginary axes for the z-plane, and then we'll place the unit circle on here for reference, too. All right, a zero at the origin. Draw a circle there. Zero at z equals minus 0.25. Looks like right there. Pole out here at minus 1.4. We'll use an x symbol for the pole, and another one at positive 0.6. And that's the result for part A. This is the pole zero diagram for h of z. Now we will need this pole zero diagram as the beginning point for part B. We want to find a stable impulse response h of n. Stable means the region of convergence, or ROC for short, must contain the unit circle. As we look at our diagram, we need to trace out two circles that intersect these two poles. Here's the first one, and here's the second one. We then select the region of convergence to contain that unit circle. That is this annulus, or washer shape. Now we describe this by saying that the magnitude of z has to be confined in the region of 0.6 up to 1.4. 
Next, we need to apply the partial fraction expansion to our system function in order to isolate the uh, individual components. It's actually more convenient to get this back in the form of z inverse, so that's what I'm taking care of right now. All right, what we would like to be able to do is break this up into f two first order terms that are added together. And we split this up based on the factors that we see down in the denominator. We need to find these two coefficients, a and b. I will also get this to match a standard form that we'll use later on in looking up our entries in the z transform table. Now let's concentrate on solving for a. What I'll do first is move the denominator to the other side of the equation, and to do that I'm really multiplying both sides by that term. Next, to make b disappear, I would like to set this to zero. And I can do that by evaluating this entire expression at z equals minus 1.4, which happens to be the pole location. Let's investigate why that sets this expression to zero. I have 1 minus 1.4 times z inverse. So evaluating z inverse at minus 1.4 leaves me with this expression. We see that that multiplies out to 1, and we have 1 minus 1 is 0. Now we do this evaluation on both sides of the equation. Therefore we see we take the original h of z, we multiply by this expression, that cancels that expression over there, we're left with the numerator, divided by the other expression involving the other pole. We then evaluate that at z equals minus 1.4. At this point, it's calculator work. And we have a is 0 0.5750. I'm going to apply the same general method to find b. Now in this case I'm multiplying by the other uh, denominator term. And I would be keeping this one. We then evaluate that at z equals 0 0.6. I'm going to cut right to the chase on that. We have b equals 0 0.4250. All right, partial fraction expansion now leaves us with this form. I can drop in the specific values for a and b. At this point, I'm going to refer to a z transform table. And this is how we can perform the inverse z transform. The two entries of interest are one that matches the form here, the one, the minus, there's a is 0.6. This has a region of convergence magnitude of z greater than a. We also see that since it's multiplied by a step function, this is a causal sequence or what we would also call a right-sided sequence starts at zero and it increases from there. Now this same expression in the z domain has a different form depending on whether or not we're looking at causal or anti-causal. Changing the step function to its anti-causal form, this is a version of the step that's been on since minus infinity and shuts down at minus one. This anti-causal sequence, or left-sided sequence as it's known, has a region of convergence that's bounded by the circle and it's on the interior. So we're looking at the intersection of these two regions of convergence. One specified as magnitude of z greater than 0.6. That means we want to use the causal sequence for this, this uh, portion of h of z. For this, we are bounded 
by 1.4. Can't get beyond that. Therefore, we use this form, that is the anti-causal sequence, for the other term for h of z. Now we can write the impulse response. We'd have the scaling factor, and then we use the anti-causal sequence form. A corresponds to minus 1.4. We raise that to the nth power, and then multiply by the negative sign and the reversed step function. Then we add in the scaled form for the other term. A is 0.6 in this case. We raise that to n, multiply by our standard step function. And that's our result for part B. Let's take a moment just to confirm that this is a stable impulse response. We know this decays towards zero. How about this one? Minus 1.4 raised to the nth power. Well, on this side, n is confined to values of zero due to the reverse step function. If we look at minus 1.4 raised to the minus n, that would look like one over minus 1.4 to the n. I think you'll agree that as n increases, that this expression also decays towards zero. Now in part c, we want to find the causal impulse response h of n. Causal means we are looking for a completely right-sided sequence. That means as we look at the pole zero diagram, we need to define the region of convergence as being outside the outermost pole. That means we need a magnitude of z greater than 1.4 in this case. We can reuse the partial fraction expansion results from part b. The difference now is we need to choose the inverse c transform uh, entries in our table to correspond to a causal sequence for each. And that's what I'm doing here. This would be our result then for part c. We observe that this term involving minus 1.4 raised to the nth power is unstable because 1.4 raised to the n as n increases just keeps getting larger and larger. Lastly in part d, does a causal and stable impulse response exist? Well, as we return to our pole zero diagram, we know that the causality would require that a right region of convergence is completely right-sided. However, stable says that we need to include the unit circle. Looks like the only way we can make this work is if this pole were moved inside the unit circle. Therefore, we would conclude, no, this is not possible we would need all the poles to be inside the unit circle. And that's part D, and that wraps up this example.